Hey everyone, and welcome to the Borgen Podcast. I'm here with Chantal, and we want to take a minute to add a special message for our listeners. The episode we're about to roll was recorded back in February, and on June 2nd, Borgen released season four entitled Power and Glory. And that is the moment we have been waiting for. I'm super excited. And just a few days before Borgen came out worldwide on Netflix, the Borgen podcast was invited to do a guest feature on the Nordic Watchlist, nordicwatchlist.com, as a two-part series to the Nordic Watch that the Nordic Watchlist did about Borgen. The second part was done by Richard Fernandez, and Richard blogs about Borgen, and he has been doing so for many years. You could check out all his work and his thoughts about Borgen at cafethinking.com. And since our piece was published on the Nordic watch list, and since the new Borgen was released on June 2nd, our podcast has seen a spike in our followers on social media, traffic to our website, and listenership and subscribers to our podcast. We want to take a minute and send a heartfelt thank you to all of you who listen and support us. Your interest and loyalty mean a lot to us, and we are committed to keep making episodes until we reach season four, uh, Power and Glory. We do this for free and for fun, and sometimes real life, like, you know, our day jobs, gets in the way of us recording as often as we would like. And we'd also like to acknowledge a few people who messaged us to kindly help us correct our Danish pronunciation, which is probably pretty abysmal at times. Neither Chantal nor I have any background in any Scandinavian language whatsoever. Um, I don't think either one of us has any Scandinavian genes either. This, This is pretty much confirmed. Um, so, um, we're going to work to do a little bit better on that. Um, some of those vowels, as you know, can be tricky. I don't even live in a country where my native language is spoken widely. So it's something that I'm kind of aware of. So I would just like to extend thank you to our listeners who are helping us out that way. It was super nice. And we had some really nice email interactions with a few fans. And so, uh, we are going to try to do a bit better with that. And we'd like to thank you all again for your support. And now we're going to roll this previously recorded episode next. Enjoy. Welcome to another bonus episode of the Borgen Podcast, the only English language show about fictional Danish politics. On our bonus episodes, we explore more of the people, events, and parties that make up the fictional Danish parliament on Borgen. And we go into a little bit deeper conversation about some of the themes and ongoing events and the personal stories a little bit more and the real life connections between the themes and the show in the bonus episodes. And um, we are Amy, that's me, and I'm coming to you from Istanbul, Turkey. And I am, as always, joined by my good friend and co-host, Chantal, who broadcasts from her room with Beautiful View in Toronto, Canada. And we'll be talking about a little bit more in depth about episodes three and four of season two, which involve a plot line concerning someone, uh, Hooks and Haven being outed as gay, potentially, and uh, being blackmailed with that information, and also a, a kind of a secrets and lies theme and a harassment theme like people have a right to their private lives and tabloid newspapers don't have a right to uh, infringe on that personal privacy. And, but that's what uh, almost happens in episode four. As we see, Logason is the one behind the Trolls, Hooks and Heaven blackmailing plot to, um, if you can hear meowing, that's just my cat in the background, um, to um, discredit Hooks and Heaven to uh, get him out of leadership, out of government altogether, as a revenge for the fact that Logason was forced to leave politics because of Huxenhaven, or so he alleges. So, you know, it's a pretty deep issue. I thought this show was very brief about how they addressed it. Um, I thought it was like, oh, Hooks is gay. There he is hooked up with a photographer and we have pictures and now he's dead. And I thought like (laughs) there could have been there could have been a little bit more um, maybe nuance, but I guess there's not always space in episodes to do that. Or like, how much emphasis do you really want to put on it? It's not like the show is oriented towards an LGBTQ plus kind of platform. It's not about that issue specifically. No, it's a political it's show. Certainly, yeah. yeah, but it isn't the personal political. Isn't that like a, an 
a first a second wave feminist statement the personal is the political and when it comes to intersectionality if you want to cross feminine that feminist thought with you know other groups civil rights it is kind of political and it's not like being gay in denmark is illegal as far as i'm aware it's not um uh, but I don't necessarily, just because see, in North America, we have this perception that the Scandinavian countries are super liberal, like everything is free, you can be who you want, it doesn't matter. But the reality might be different from what we have as an image. So that information could be potentially very damaging to a public figure still, mm -hmm. um, if people's opinions aren't always progressive and supportive. You know, yeah. and I found, I thought that was part of the big seriousness in this issue. And it, it also like, it's just unfathomable to me how a person would want to destroy somebody that badly and not be aware that the consequences of outing someone like that wouldn't just be career consequences. There'd be personal consequences. There's mental health consequences. You can't do that to people. Mm -hmm. It's just so wrong to me. It's like not something that I would ever do. I have, I, I had a frenemy here a few years ago, and I happen to know something about her personal life that could have cost her, her job potentially. Okay. Or like definitely caused issues with her professional life. And she kind of backstabbed me and I never said a word about it to anyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's no way I would do that. Like there's, I, I could have easily to get my revenge, but there's no way I would do that. What's the point of doing that? And eventually I think it would come back and bite me as well. Yeah, yeah. So like, mm -mm. I'd rather keep secrets like that and let people, I figure if people are gonna destroy themselves, they're gonna do it in their own way. Let them do it. Let mm -hmm. them take the fall that they're gonna take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just to recap episode three and four for any listeners that did not listen to our previous episode we just aired, uh, episode yes. three, season two, is the, is the episode where they go to the government retreat. Uh, they're having a seminar by the seaside and Hoxenhaven is attending and things are very sort of contentious between him and Brigitte. But Michael Lagasin, who's the owner of Express and previous contender for PM and he lost to Brigitte and he gets yes, he, to, he he decides that he knows Hoxenhaven from a very long time ago and knows that Hoxenhaven is attracted to men and has had relationships with men in the past and Hoxenhaven decides that he's going to uh, or Lagasin decides that he's going to hire this you know young blonde fake photographer to be on express yeah. staff so that he can show up at the at the seminar where Hoxenhaven is at and proceeds to seduce Hoxenhaven and photos are taken of them in a sexual sexual situation. Mm -hmm. And in the next uh, episode, episode four, this these photos actually become a major part of episode four, where Logason is really gunning to write a damaging article about Hoxenhaven to bring him down. And he wants to uh, make Katrine and, and, and Han be, be, be party to that and have them write the articles. And we see how nasty Logson becomes by trying to do this to Hoxenhaven. And, you know, there's a few things that we were talking about uh, in the previous episode and also offline, Amy, about the time period yeah. of this. So this was you know, early 2010, it might have been 2010 or 2011, so about 10, yeah. 11 years ago. Um, and also the the awareness that people have or lack of awareness about issues like this, that these are not frivolous issues that you can bring down someone about. And they have, as you said, serious mental health uh, reactions and, and um uh, consequences to the person that is being outed but also oh, yeah it, it's it's and and I also and we were talking about this offline that that you know Lagasin is not our favorite character he's very slimy and underhand and unethical and immoral but he really doesn't seem to understand or maybe he does understand but I don't think he understands the magnitude of this story outing someone as being gay is a very serious it's a crime. You cannot do that to another person, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's we also, vile. 
Yeah, and we also talked about it could be also in some cultures, I mean, homosexuality and being queer, so being non-straight is, is people, people, first of all, it's illegal in some countries still, mm-hmm. and uh-huh. people know that, and they, they, they use that as a very angry and sharp weapon against someone, which is, yes. which is, which is horrible. Um, yeah. It's yeah. like, it would be like, I mean, obviously, okay, you can't, you know, you can't, you can't always make analogous racial issues and gender and identity politics and stuff, but it would be like telling someone they're illegal because of their skin color. Like you're illegal. Like you have as much control over your sexuality as you do. Like, it's like, it, like, gen- you know what I mean? It's a yeah. genetic inherent thing. It's not something you decide to do. And if sexuality was a choice, seriously, if sexuality was a choice, why would anybody choose to be on the side that faces the most discrimination, the most violence, the most legislation against them, the yeah. most penal the penalties, you know? Like in Canada, gay marriage became legal in 2005. I think we were one of the first countries that made it legal. Us, mm-hmm. Spain and Netherlands, I think, were early adapters of that. Mm -hmm. And like for years and years and years, homosexuality was like actually illegal. People went to jail for it. You know, I mean, one of the most, I mean, I, I, I actually am in the community. Okay. And I, I really felt Hawks and Haven's pain. And, you know, Amy and I were discussing a bit in the last episode, but also offline uh, in preparation to record this episode and the previous one we just released uh, is that, this 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 is the biggest shakeup a person can can go through both personally and yeah. having that knowledge inside of you to vocalize it takes a lot of courage but also um as we're t- and, and amy so i did something really great in 2019 for pride month um and i'm so glad i always lived it up and had parties and you know brought mm-hmm. people together because then the pandemic hit and you know basically no one has been here in two and a half years but Amy, yeah. you were here in 2019. And yes, um, I was. You saw that what I did in my apartment is that I turned it into a gallery and I was highlighting people, humans that made tremendous impact on the LGBT community because 2019 was the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots in New York City. Right. And how important that is as the root and foundation for the LGBT movement globally. And it was mm-hmm. it, it's important to note that that was led by two trans women of color um, yes. who, uh, who, who led that. And it happened in New York City in one late night at the end of June. This is why Pride is usually in June for most places. Yes. At the Stonewall Inn in New York City where Yep, LGBT. It's in Greenwich Village. Yeah, it were being it's still there. Tar- it's still there. I used to live in New York. I've been there. It's still mm-hmm. there. I think it's still there now. I mean, I moved away from New York yes. for a long time ago, but um, yeah, I, I was mean, looking at a map. I, I was looking at a map of New York actually because the I'm a literature teacher and we're studying Catcher in the Rye in grade ten, which is set in New York in the 1950s, and The Great Gatsby, which is set in New York in the 1920s. So I was looking at current maps of New York to figure out like different neighborhoods or like where Holden was walking around. And yeah, yeah the stone wall is still there because he goes to Greenwich Village at some point for a, a jazz concert. Right, right. And yeah, it's still there. And, it's still and, there, but um, this was the place where police yes. would 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 uh, come there and hang out and harass patrons going in there yep. and, uh, you know, arrest them. And this is one night when led by these two women of color, uh, Marsha P. Johnson, an African-American mm-hmm. trans woman, and Sylvia Rivera, uh, uh, mm-hmm. a Latin American Hispanic background woman, decided I think so, no yeah. this is this is the oh, end definitely. of it we are going to fight back to the police and this is what sort of started all that so in my place i had a gallery i set up a gallery uh marcia p johnson and sylvia rivera were prominently displayed and their amazing historical and significant contribution highlighted as well as i featured a bunch of other um prominent people uh who were the first couples to get married in canada people mm-hmm. who had led uh, 
you know, anti-discrimination and anti-bullying to LGBT people in my, in my place. It, and it was, it was great to do that because that's what pride is about. And I think a lot of people mm -hmm. that are not LGBT or who are strong allies like you, Amy, who do Thank you. take a lot of time to really understand where we come from, they have no mm -hmm. idea how hard it is to walk in this road alone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and to have to vocalize it and, and say, you know, if you get outed or come out to your parents or, you know, to be brave, to, to have a partner and hold, hold her hand in public or, or people don't yeah. even think about that. Right. All the I know. liberties that straight people have that you all can display yeah. marriage photos and wear a ring and everyone can yeah. ask you, Oh, where's your husband? Where's your husband? Well, actually it's not a husband. Well, I'm not married, but I'm just saying, like, yeah. um, they don't my understand. wife, she's at home. <laughs> <laughs> they don't imagine. They yeah. don't understand that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's terrifying. That's why I, this episode, episode four, really resonated deeply with me. And before yeah. that, I I didn't like Hawks and Haven. I remember seeing this over a year ago and saying, "Oh, this guy is so slimy." And but after yeah, he's just like underhanded. Everything about him is so underhanded. Yeah, and he came in log and he's sly. They they actually yeah, they are from the same cloth actually. They're both uh yep. slimy and and disgusting, right? Yeah. Um if you so guys yeah, can I, hear my cat really sorry, sorry if you can hear my cat because she comes and wants to play at this time of night. It's like she has a rope she drags around the house and it's time to play with it. So th there you go. If you uh, hear meowing, that's what it is. got her lifted and up on the camera. I can see her. She's so sweet. Hi Jackie. <laughs> Jackie, say something for the people. No? Okay. Sometimes Maybe she later. talks to me when Amy's leaving. Yeah, I know. Jackie, Jackie yeah. can be heard. What? Um, yeah. So <laughs> there almost, you go. almost she little, squeaked. Yeah. A little squeak. So yeah. So it, I, it just broke my heart to see. And I don't like yeah. Hawks and Haven. And this is the beauty of the show, Amy. We talked about this before in season one. Like the writing is so excellent where this guy is a total dick. But then you see him in this situation, especially me being in the LGBT community. I understand what he's going through. You know, yes, absolutely. It's, it's when is Pride this year, Chantal, in Toronto? By the way, uh, it'll be the end of June. Um, end of June. Do you it's know always what's happening. The end of June, like the last Sunday of June, is the Grand March uh, that mm -hmm. they have. But actually, Pride here is a month long. Um, yeah. So starting June first, they'll have celebrations all over the city. Yeah. So. Well. Yeah, uh, we should talk about that when we're finished this call because I might be in Toronto for that this year. Wow. Well, great. Yes, I have to. I, it's been two and a half years since three years since I was home. I have to go see my parents. So and I have some uh, things to clear up business stuff to clear up in Toronto. So I'm going to be coming to Toronto this summer to do that. So we might end up recording an episode at your actual house. Let's see what <laughs> happens. Um, it's something we can maybe think about doing. But um so hopefully i'll you know we'll be there maybe i don't know we'll see what happens with like of course you know restrictions and like comfort levels of being outside and stuff but may there might be a few things we can end up yeah choosing to attend so let's see what the situation is but i just want to say like as a, I, I mean obviously from my my goofy comments and like <clears throat> you know little sides about like you know, the, the relationships and like Casper's sexuality and Katrine and them, it's pretty obvious that I'm, I'm straight or like, I'd say like mostly straight. Sometimes I wonder if I don't even qualify as sort of a, a queer person in some manner as well, because the heterosexual normative, you know, June Cleaver kind of leave it to beaver old school marriage partner, car, kids, mortgage, life, is not the life that I have ever aspired to. And it's mm -hmm. not what I'm interested in having. And I wonder, you know, I don't like, even though I'm attracted to, in theory, men, they, at least they say they're men. A lot of them, who can really say if they really are truly men or not? A lot of them- By the so way much. they act. By the way they act. I'm talking about their behavior, not being adults. They're obviously male bodies, but they're not necessarily adults. You know, they, they their have mind. immaturity issues and whatever else. So- you know, but I mean, imagine having the luxury to never have to tell anyone who you like. It's just assumed, oh, you like, you like boys because you're a girl. Assuming both of those things as true, just based on somebody's appearance, it seems ridiculous to me now. 
And like, I yeah. work with kids, I work with youth. Okay. I work with young people. And yes, I live in a somewhat conservative society because I'm living in Turkey, which has a completely different history, completely different attitudes. Mm-hmm. And a culture. lot of people think, yeah. And a lot of people think, you know, oh, Turkey is like the Middle East and it's very religious and fundamentalist. And I'm like, no, there's that aspect of the population is definitely here, but there's also a very secular, very progressive, very, you know, forward, quote unquote, liberal thinking aspect of the society as well. I mean, a lot of people here go to university. A lot of people here travel. A lot of people want to see a future where these things aren't defined as strictly and certainly not in the traditional you know, ways that things have been defined up till now. And the youth I'm working with, a lot of them are identifying as genderqueer, or they're using they pronouns, or they're, you know, actually dating in same sex couples. Um, And it's really, it's really been eye opening. It's like, these kids, these young, these kids today, they're like digital natives, they're online they don't have geographical barriers in the same way we did when we were growing up. Right. And they don't have societal like identity barriers the same way that we did when we were growing up either. Like there's all in the background running in the background of, you know, and if you're online and you're looking for this kind of stuff, you can find groups of people who will support you in coming out and like exploration and stuff. Oh, absolutely. And imagine that being so close by and, and, Online relationships are normal now. I mean, yeah. not just because of the pandemic either. No, for gay like, people, for straight people, for trans people, for yeah. people, for pan people. I mean, this is where you meet people in this day and age, right? Yeah, it's how you socialize. I'm in like a bunch of different groups on social media that talking about all kinds of different issues. And, you know, it, it's like I have virtual friends. Like I could go to X place and like know somebody would take me out for drink, you know, right. and that I've never met that person in real life. Yeah, but these relationships are just as real as face-to-face relationships. And and they're 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 vital to have those relationships. So let me just touch upon again and through the lens of an an LGBT person yeah. like you know I'm a I'm a member of the Inside Out Film Festival here which is the LGBT film festival. It's been going on uh in 2020 I think or 2020 I think it was 2020 they they celebrated their 30th anniversary. So wow. very thankful to live in a such a vibrant, uh, you know, global progressive city as Toronto is. And Amy, you lived here for a very long yeah. time. You know that. But uh, in the pandemic, the Inside Out uh, 2020 was their 30th year anniversary. And everyone was all excited. You know, what are they going to do? It's going to be a big splash. This is something very special and important. So anyways, they turned their film festival in 2020 and 2021 into a virtual film festival. And with yeah, that, they um, opened it up. They had geo-blocked it to Ontario. So if you lived in the province of Ontario, um, then you were able to access these films. And my, you know, some of my LGBTQ friends and I were talking and saying how fantastic this is because would we not have wanted this when we were youth growing up to know that there's a space where we can watch movies in the comfort of our home. We don't have to spend money to travel somewhere. Um, you know, we might be students. We don't have our own financial independence. Yeah. Can and just, you can do it privately on your computer in your own room. Yes. And feel that like- sense of community. You talk about community, Amy, that's so important. I mean, growing up, I was a teenager of the mid nineties and like, there was no internet. You know, the internet yeah. started coming out like I would say late 90s, early 2000s. But we didn't have social media. We didn't have Twitter yeah. and things like that to connect with people and find other groups or go to virtual support groups. But the youth now have that. Um, yes. And actually, the- even, even the idea is like a straight kid you know, like movies and popular culture is how a lot of young people figure sexuality out. It's where they see sexuality portrayed. Like I used to watch all these like indie films and stuff. This is probably why I have such a tragically stupid romantic life (laughs) because I have so heavily influenced by like these, you know, these like steamy French movies that I would watch as a teenager that are like, you know, all about like these young girls, like being led astray by older men or like, you know, two young teenagers like running away together and stuff. And, you know, even, even, even as a straight kid, that that's how we access and help cope with our feelings and stuff. Yeah. 
So for for queer kids or LGBTQ plus, I forget how many letters there are now. There are so many letters. I want everyone to be included. Yes. I I've you know and like to to see all of those different options available. That must yeah. be like incredible. Like how exciting, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the other thing about the inside out, which is amazing. So I, I love the festival. I'm a member. I take that week off. It's actually a 10 day festival every year, but I, I take the working days off because I yeah. usually like Amy, if you remember from the past, like 2019, I saw 17 screenings the years before yeah. I was like 13, 14 screenings every year. Right. And one of the most amazing screenings they have, the first day the film festival opens, no, the Friday, so the second day Mm -hmm. of the festival, day two, they always have something called Youth Day. And I purposely go to those screenings. And so what happens is there's busloads of kids that they bring in from the suburbs, Mm -hmm. downtown Toronto on King West, King and John, a very famous, popular hotspot where the Tiff Bell Lightbox is where this film festival runs and these kids can come in and access. And the other great thing that film festivals do, especially the inside out is they partner with, with youth groups that are LGBT yes. and they come in and they say, you know, these are the resources. It's okay. Blah, blah, blah. But for me, you know, I'm over 40. I still find value in going to the youth day because it reminds me of my youth as a person that knew what I was from seven years old. How do yeah. the kids on in these films deal and struggle with their sexuality it's 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 the most heartbreaking but beautiful that they beautiful thing to see that they they have it better figured out than we did back then yeah right um and all the portrayals you talk about movies I mean imagine growing up in a world where if you're LGBT every single message is hetero couples right yeah and and this dialogue which you say you deviate from and it's not your life either to you know you know one two three husband you know children house this that I mean this is yeah I'm much more of a Peggy Olsen than a Betty Draper (laughs) yes and we're talking about Mad Men which is in the American (laughs) that uh we had girls night, Amy and I, and two other friends who are listening to this podcast. Hello. You know, who Hi. You um, <laughs> but every Sunday we would go to someone's house and watch Mad Men and we became very, uh, you know, glued Tight to the series. Way. We watched the whole series. And when the series, the season finale ended, you were here, Amy, and we had a yes. mad, mad Men party. Remember you made us. Yes. Uh, old fashions. Oh, mad old fashions. Yes. Old fashions. Yeah which is what uh, Don Draper drinks. What Don Draper uh, drinks. Yeah. That's why also like when we, you know, like as a literature teacher, like we're always told like representation matters. And of course it does. Of course it does. I want to, I'm always pressing to have more works. I mean, everything is so canonical because everybody wants it classic here. Yeah. Um, But I'm always trying to push to find authors that are female characters that are female, but at the same time, even when I was growing up and reading a book like Catcher in the Rye, which is about a boy written by a male author who was mm-hmm. very famously kind of dodgy in his relationships. Um, Salinger, you can go find out if you want to know more about Salinger's scandals, you can go Google him. Just check his Wikipedia page. That's all it takes. Mm-hmm. Um, but like characters like Holden or like Pony Boy and the Outsiders, which okay was granted written by a woman, but is about boys again. I never really never occurred to me that like I can't think or feel like these characters because they're boys like yeah just that wasn't a barrier to me it was like oh I'm just like Holden I feel the same way as him I never thought about oh he's a boy so I can't feel those things and I'm a girl I can't feel those things I have to have a different thing like no you know and it's important as a young person for your parents to raise you that way raise their kids that way that yeah there is not one path down life you should know no. kids that look different sound different behave differently than you we're all valid and important right yeah and this will shape yourself as a young person but also allow you to become a great friend to someone who's struggling right as we see Hawksenhaven struggles I mean this is the thing that cracks him and this mm-hmm. is this is something that he cannot hide anymore and He, I was figuring out, Amy, I got up this morning thinking about us recording and thinking about what we're going to say for this bonus episode. And I was thinking to myself, Hoxenhaven must have been a child of the 60s, I would say. 
Yeah. I would say he's about 50 in 2010, Mm -hmm. right? Does that Mm -hmm. make sense? Yes. And growing up in that time, I mean, you don't, you don't talk about gay stuff, right? No, there's no place for it, but then imagine. Or if, if it came out, it would be considered very weird and deviant, like, or like highly unusual and theatrical, like Liberace or something. And he wouldn't be taken seriously in politics. No, not at all. I'm sure you can hear my cat. I'm sorry. She's what really wants to play. And like, this happens to me in zoom calls. It happens to me in <laughs> lessons all the time. Sorry, people guest spot. Yeah. My older cat sleeps. She doesn't care about any of this. Yeah. But anyway, but going yeah, back it's to, go ahead. I, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. So you go ahead. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, going back to Borg and we were chatting offline about did, did the show handle this adequately? Yeah, did they? And and should they have given more attention to this plot? Now, we both noted that this episode, episode four, turned very quickly in a matter of minutes. This whole yeah, it was super dark unraveled the from the scene on the marble bridge with Largason yeah. to uh, the ending of the episode turned very, very quickly. Yeah, um, and I think that's like 10 minutes of running time. Like, it's like not a lot of running time. No. It's like a short amount of minutes in the show but we 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 did say that you know this is a political show should they have done more about the mental health of lgbt people should we have done should they have done more about uh you know why this was so complicated should they have like gone into more of hawk saban's life and struggle i i don't know um I yeah i don't know Saban either Grace, for me like that i was very satisfied with was the way brigitte handled it Right. Yes. That she had compassion towards him and she, it could have yeah. been easy for all the things that he's done against her. It could have been easy for her to say, not You're have your own, but him. not yeah, my like, problem. Yeah. Not my yeah, problem. There's nothing. Yeah. It's not my response. Like your scandals aren't my issue, you know? No. And like, she could exactly. have taken pleasure in that scandal to know that that's going to bring him down, but she acted like a friend. And I think that's important to note when anyone comes out to you in your life, whether they're, you know, a teenager or a child, you know, many of us know from when we're small children, I mean, there's no language to that at seven years mm-hmm. old, there was no language. I no, knew what I felt, not. but I didn't know what it meant. I just knew that maybe I should have been born a boy because that's what the girls pay attention to what girls Mm -hmm. pay attention to me. But having said that, I never wanted to change my gender. I'm happy being a female, but in that time there, you have to realize when someone comes out to you, it's a very, you're, you're, it's a very sacred role you play as the friend you have. And I've had, I've had kids come out to me in my job. Of course, of course, like in the last few years, you know, or like, Um, and I always take that very, very seriously. I always say like, this is a safe space. Like you can tell me if you have any trouble or any, you know, and I've had kids like coming to me like, oh, like last year, um, one of my students online, um, asked to speak to me kind of off, like after the lesson. And they said that they were changing to a they, and this was someone who was biologically born female okay Mm -hmm. like in air quotes like at a female body type Mm -hmm. um and um they said they wanted to be a they and they were feeling more like maybe they felt more masculine and were really questioning their identity and sexuality and stuff and that was part of I was like concerned because this kid wasn't showing up to school very much I mean it was online school was kind of a write-off year anyway Mm -hmm. here like there was a lot of space made for kids struggling with the online thing, which is good. Um, but, you know, they were really struggling. They went through a name change and, you know, that person, that kid ended up leaving our school. I don't think it was because of any bullying issues or anything. Mm-hmm. As far as I'm aware, I think it was just a geography. Geog- I think they moved. Um, so it was really, but it was really touching that somebody would feel like safe and like explain all those things to me. And the way the student did it, it was very straightforward. Like, I feel like this, I want to use these pronouns. It would help me if you could use them too. And I, I always checked. I was like, are you okay with me using your pronouns in front of other kids? Like, are you ready to do that Mm -hmm. publicly? Mm -hmm. And they were like, yes, it's fine. And so that's what I did. And I'm sure there were kids who like made fun of, made fun of them. And like, 
you know, didn't take it seriously and stuff, but there were other kids who definitely did take it seriously and who were very supportive. And so that was good. And well, I remember being yeah. in a group of girls and another girl just mentioning like casually, like, oh, well, like, you know, it's, you know, or something, something, oh, like how I like girls. And I, and she was like, and how I just outed myself. And I was like, oh, I said, you know, I know you, that's okay. I'm like, I'm not surprised. And the girl, the girl was like, <laughs> I know, you know, me, so I think, you know, and I think actually, I think I often get people ask me if I'm queer all the time. They're like, so do you date women? And I'm like, actually, surprisingly, no, I'm a very queer presenting straight person. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah no amy some of my Short haircuts that's and the joke with butchie. my friends some of my friends thought you were too i know and we know who they are too yeah we i know, know. that's I mean, so funny yeah yeah it and, is funny. yeah I, and i think one of them was really disappointed actually at one point <laughs> i was okay. like sorry i don't take well, women you'll have to tell me you'll have to tell me who that is later that's funny um <laughs> but yeah i mean what i a don't, little a little bit you know i, I what i don't like is this presumption that everyone is the same and everyone is straight you know like yeah. uh before you even and you were talking about this last season on our show here that before you even open your mouth people have cast you into you're going to be someone's wife yeah. and you are you know, you're going to have a husband and all this. And it's just, it's just nonsense. Like the world is so much bigger than this people. Like, yeah. Even, and, even at doctor's appointments, are you going to freeze your eggs? Don't you want to have children? I'm like, no. And no. Yeah. You know, like, don't presume, don't tell me what I want with my life and my body. And like, fuck right off. Like, I'm or, just or like, presume, you know, like presume, presume that you want certain things, you know? Yeah. Um, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But I have to say, and, like, how heartwarming it was when you told me some of those stories with your students. I remember you telling yeah. me some of those stories. And I just felt so proud of, of, of you that, and of, of oh. myself as well that I have a friend that is so, like, you're not just working in a job by yourself. You're, you're, you're a mentor to these kids. And it made me feel very proud that they had you there, not just as a teacher giving them homework, but as someone that they can confide in. Because... As a younger person growing up, I mean, there were no, for me, there was, there was no representation, right? Yeah. There was no, like in the 2010s when Borgen came out, this was also when shows like Glee came out in North America, where yeah. there were by Ryan Murphy, who's openly gay, who's extremely yeah. successful. Um, you were talking about Amy in the 1950s, I think at some point, I think we both watched Hollywood, which was Brian, Brian. Yeah. Ryan Murphy and talking about how there's a certain code, like you don't say certain stuff. Right. And mm -hmm. in the 1950s, how do you meet people? I mean, there was a very famous person in real life, Scotty, somebody, and he was basically like um, a matchmaker for people who mm -hmm. were, you know, you know, had to present as straight, but he would on the, on the behind the scenes meet and make matches for these people, right? I mean, how yeah. many people in, in, in relationships live a double life, right? Yeah. Because they have to be a certain way, right? I mean, it's just like, you, you're, we're both literature majors. Amy is, a, is an English teacher now, but like mm -hmm. uh, talking about one of the literary greats, Virginia Woolf, and her mm -hmm. relationships with women, Vita Sackville West, and how both of them were in that relationship together. And actually, The Inside Out brought a film about their story a few years ago. It might have been 2017 or 18 or something around there, where they were in a full on relationship with each other, but they had to stay married. Right. Yeah. Yep. Like Oscar, like Oscar Wilde. Yeah. One of your right. favorites. Yeah. And, and I was, t I mean, I just, with my AP students, I just earlier this year at the end of last semester, right before I went to Paris, I taught the French symbolists and Wilde gets the folded into the symbolist movement, even though he was an Irish English writer. And of course, famously, I mean, he went to prison for being gay. He refused to, um, he refused to just accept this he, he he went on trial on purpose to prove that he was being libeled by his lover's father and of course in the end it it all got turned around and bit him in the butt and he so to speak and he got sent to prison for two years and it ruined him he died right after he got out he was like out of prison for two years and then he died um from injuries and illness based because of what happened to him in prison and like 
you know, his novel Dorian Gray is a, is a seminal queer novel, and it was influenced by uh, a book called Aribor in French, Against Nature, by a guy named uh, Joris Karl Huysman, who wrote about that character, the main character in that book. It's a classic symbolist novel. So everything the guy does is symbolic of something else. But he had relationships with men and women in the book and is very out about it, very open mm -hmm. about it. Um, I taught about um, also Paul Verlaine and Arthur Rimbaud, who had a very tumultuous relationship. One shot the other one in the hand because their intimacy, they got together. Rimbaud was very young. Uh, Verlaine was older and married to a young woman, quite a bit younger than him. And they had a child together. And Arthur Rimbaud moved into their house with them. That must have gone well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah, know, and yeah. it was very tumultuous and very violent. And in the midst, they're like making all this great literature and stuff. And so like, you know, it's always been part of the culture. Rambo was out, by the way, he was out. He did not care who knew. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it caused him all kinds of difficulties, you know? And just the, 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 the struggle that, that people in the community have historically gone through, it's just so, to me, it's so colossally unfair. It's like, as if being queer or, having a different gender identity or being gay is so different or unusual. It's part of human culture. It's been around but since it's, the beginning it's, of It's not different. We, we all want the same things, Amy. How many times have yeah. you and I on personal chats with each other talked about who broke, who recently broke our heart and who recently disappointed us? We, if you, if you put a, a filter on our voice and someone else listened, our hurt and struggles and pain and disappointment or is happiness the same. is the same. Right? Yeah, it doesn't not, matter. We're not different. <laughs> no, we, you know human beings, human, human beings, beings, people. And I think, you know, you're talking about these older people, like uh, from history, let's say, an mm. excellent series that I absolutely love. And every friend of mine is probably fed up with me talking about is Gentleman Jack, which is the yes. story of the real life Anne Lister, L-I-S-T-E-R, who was the first very amazing woman, landowner, businesswoman, traveler, uh, you know, openly gay woman, gender non-conforming, who journaled all of her feelings in code because she wasn't able to express them in regular mm -hmm. writing. When she died, they found her journals and they had to transcribe her, all her journals, which was done by this, I guess she's a historian, uh, Helena Whitbread, and spent years cracking the code and transcribing everything mm -hmm. well anyways bbc slash hbo made this series gentleman jack in which it stars the amazing saran jones british actress mm -hmm. and they actually use Anne lister's real words from her journal and to me in the in the queer community this is the most important figure because she was the first known figure to document in this way feelings of of same-sex attraction and relationships and gender nonconformity before that yeah. was it was it validated or is this something people choose this is not something people choose right no it is no um so that yeah. show is coming out and in that show you were talking about this domestic uh situation where these two men and this woman were living together mm -hmm. a lot of people have to make choices to survive so a lot of Ann Lister's female lovers, yes, they had a thing together and it was great and it was fun. And, and Lister, of course, was looking for a wife even back then. That connection and desire was there to have a wife. And these women left her because they wanted stability. Yeah. They wanted to marry a man. They wanted financial stability. They wanted societal stability. So it's really yeah. sad that people don't understand what's at stake here. Yeah. And it's like, that's the tragedy about the whole Borgen thing. Like, why wasn't poor Hooks and Haven able to be out? Why did he get married in the first place? Yeah. You know, like that's that to me, like there's a real question there. And if, if, if they were going to, I guess, if the series was about him, we would find out. Right. Well, but that perhaps, would take a whole other sideline. Like yes, that would be and, a lot of story. to And develop. perhaps before he decided or had the inclination to become a politician, he knew he was gay. 
Yeah. Right. But if he, if he lived in a debt and we talked about this in the last episode, it's, it's also the decade that you are growing up in. What resources do you have? Like, you know, some of the boys, my friends that you met when you were here in Mm -hmm. 2019, you know, they've got young nieces and they were, they were telling me that, uh, you know, in, in the schools and these nieces are not in downtown Toronto, they're a little bit outside um, about, you know, 30 minutes outside, 40 minutes yep. outside of Toronto, they were saying that in these kids elementary school, there are posters about uh, rainbow symbolism and LGBT awareness. And I'm just like, what? Some of that has been banned here in Turkey. Yeah. Like um, fashion brands aren't allowed to advertise it like that anymore, like rainbow colored clothes and stuff. There was a controversy about that last year. And for the record, speaking of the reason why I was definitely going to be marching in the, we were like, we went to the parade and we were in the parade. I wasn't marching in it. We were watching it. But the reason why I was here in 2019. Yeah. yeah, And why that was so important to me in particular that year is because these kids had come out to me, the kids coming out to me here in Turkey. And although it is not technically illegal to be gay here, as far as I am aware, there's no law about it. It's certainly not widely acceptable. And mm-hmm. beca- after 2013 and the Gezi Park riots, which is a whole other kettle of fish to talk about here, um, which was basically a, a nationwide government protest, anti-government protest about development and ecology and a bunch of stuff. It all came to the boil in that summer. Um, and ten, just to see how big of a boil was it? 10,000 gas canisters were released by police in a 10 day period or something. No, 30,000. It was like a year's supply of tear gas was used in 10 days. So yeah, it was pretty rough. And then since then, um, pride parades have actually been shut down as have most public protests and public gatherings here. But pride in particular is very targeted by police. People get arrested. I have a friend here who's a photojournalist who works for, um, a foreign press agency, but he lives here. He's a Turkish-based photographer. Mm -hmm. And he's been arrested multiple times. He's in Ukraine right now, actually, Mm -hmm. um, most recently. And he's been in like Afghanistan and a bunch of other, you know, touchy areas. Um, But he has been arrested for um, documenting attempts at having pride parades here since 2015. They've been banned. Yeah, for sure. So it's, it's really to see that and like live in a society like that here. And there's also a lot of violence against the trans community here, like real nasty killings and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly a community of trans sex workers in Istanbul. Um, And I have a friend, my friend, I'm gonna give him a shout out actually. My friend, Josh Kunishar is a filmmaker and photographer here. And he has a book called Blackout. And he wrote, he did like a, series of of photo it's like photo essays about the people on the margins of society and which is why it's called blackout um Mm -hmm. and he was um kind of almost like embedded in in the lives of these trans sex workers in a particular neighborhood in istanbul and he documented their experiences and like the violence against them and like also he was uh, with street kids and stuff And he got to know some of them and sort of got to know their stories. And he published this book of photos about it. And his most recent work, which is going to be featured in the Istanbul Film Festival, which will be over by the time this airs. But anyway, if you see this film out there, people, if it gets wider distribution, it's called Kudelka Crossing the Same River. And it's about Joseph Fidelka, Joseph Kudelka, who is a Czech photographer, very famous photographer, actually, who's done a lot of work in Turkey. And Josh can work with him. And then he ended up making Mm -hmm. a film about him because he's kind of his mentor and there's no documentation of Kudelka's process as a photographer. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with LGBTQ issues, but uh, that that project doesn't, but the first one did. And it was really interesting to to talk to someone who's a very, you know, born and raised in Istanbul, um, the same age as me. So in the nineties, he was in his twenties and Josh can like just never had problems with like being around LGBTQ people like he's like completely open-minded and to like to go and document those stories here or and like around in the early 2000s I think in the 2010s he was doing this and a little bit before actually uh must have been really sketchy 
and brave to do because people don't talk about that here. Yeah. I mean, to me, when I look at friends who are our age, even people we know who are parents and, you know, I'm, I'm proud that they've become parents because I know that they're going to shape their kids. Right. And all of this comes from, from, from your upbringing. And when we see Lagesson bully and harass um, Hoxenhaven, to me, this mm. comes from his upbringing that you were not raised with knowledge that there are other people who are not like you that are just as valuable and valid as yeah. you. And or the idea that being gay is bad and problematic. But actually like, being gay is such a small part of who we are. Like my, my identity exactly. is not that. That is a small private part of who I am. Like, yeah, you know, like your your well, sex I, life does not affect your job, okay? <laughs> like it no, just but, doesn't, but, but unless you're saying, a sex worker. Right, like we saw in, uh, <laughs> in, in season four there or episode four. Yeah, like with the, 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 the Danish stallion. He's like, yeah. tell town, oh, I only do men. But what a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, being gay as a youth, it's it's terrible. There are so many families that throw their their children out. There yeah. are, you know, substance that abuse, I, there are mental health issues. Yes. People who are taking their own lives. It's, yes. They don't realize That's, there's more beyond, why didn't you just say it? It's not a big deal. Well, it actually is a big deal if you are, you know, and actually- It's a huge deal. I was telling the guys this, um, the friends, uh, and I was saying that, you know, I, even when I go to pride parades and, uh, you know, there's all the rainbow stuff we wear. Amy, when you came here, mm-hmm. I give you beads and whatever rainbow yep. rainbow decorations to wear, paraphernalia or whatever. I but- still pull my erase homophobia from the OSSTF, the Ontario Secondary Teachers Association <laughs> Federation eraser out, and like use that at work. You got yeah. that from the uh, from the parade. Oh, it's from yeah, 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 yeah. and but, pencils and like some other swag and stuff. But but what I'm saying, like for me, because I I actually am when I yeah. leave certain places, I do put that stuff away because yeah. I I know what it's like to. I, well, I don't. I shouldn't say I know because I don't know. I've never been harassed or harmed or anything like that. But I know where that's so I know lucky. where it, I know where it can go. So I don't. Yeah advertise myself, shall we say. And what yeah, straight yeah, people yeah. don't understand is everywhere we go, we have to, we have to come out, you know, yeah. like I, I don't walk around wearing rainbows and I don't think, I mean, I don't think people like people in my professional life, the presumption might be, Oh, do you live with your husband? And I'm just like, no, no one has said that to yeah. me. I'm kind of, you know, very kind of formal, but like, yeah. And also like you work in professional environments where it's not a thing. Like yeah. here, people people ask much more personal questions and talk about much more personal things because the it's the automatic assumption. It's like, oh, are you married? Do you have kids? Do you want to have kids? And I'm like, no, no. no but it's no, just like, no. are people so? And then they're dumb like, that that's are all you, they have to talk about. Yeah, but don't you want to have a husband? Don't you want to be married? I'm like, from the stories I've heard, apparently I don't. <laughs> because not- nobody's happy. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. Um, I do know a few people who are married to really fantastic Turkish men who are like ace people and like treat me like family and look after yeah. me like they're my brothers. Like, mm-hmm. yes, fantastic Loving relationships and here. And yeah, yeah, and kind and generous and open. Like, and and I've also met the opposite who were like very close minded and weird and creepy and gross. You know, so. But I guess, you know, that's the same in any society, isn't it? It's not unique to here. But um, from Turkish women, sometimes the presumption is like, oh, you're a woman, so you must want exactly the same things as me. And it's like, no. Nope. No, I think everyone should just be happy to choose what they want. But, you know, yeah. going back to Hoxenhaven for a second here, I mean, I... I did, like I said, I didn't really like him, but I just like wanted to weep for him because I understood where he was coming from. It takes a lot of courage. Me too. I mean, even me, the, you know, the fellas in my life that, you know, the group of guys, I mean, you know, a couple of them I met through the LGBT group at UFT and it took a lot of courage for me to, to, to go there as ridiculous yeah. as that sounds. How can you Chantal, who's so like, you know, outspoken and well-spoken and like, you know, smart and this and that. Well, that's what people say. I don't know if I actually am, but 
How could, <laughs> how could you be of course you are. nervous about going to a group? And it's like, you don't understand. If I show up there, I'm not showing up there as a straight person, as an ally. I'm showing up making a nonverbal announcement about myself, right? So yeah. are you ready for that? And uh, people don't understand what that means. So I was yeah, very disheartened I mean, to see what happened to Hawks and Haven. The way I deal with students who come out to me is actually based a lot on the stories you've told me about how it was for you growing up, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And like keeping in mind that, you know, just because these kids have relatively good homes or whatever, like relatively socioeconomically okay or whatever it is, doesn't mean that those particular kids are going to have a supportive environment at home. And it was Correct. super important to me. It is this is like my teaching philosophy, actually, like, you know, people have teaching philosophies and some of them are like, let's get the curriculum done in the most creative way possible. I'm like, let's use the curriculum as a medium to allow the students to become the people that they are supposed to be. That has nothing to do with me. I have to facilitate their growth as human beings, whatever that may mean. Well, it, yes. And it also means presenting work to them that is not all presenting tech text yes. like novels to them, your literature teacher, that are not all the same dialogue. It's important for young people to, if you, if you don't have friends that are LGBT or anything that is different from you, right? It's important yeah. that you, as, as, as intimately as you can, i.e. through a book, reading yeah. the internal thoughts of someone who's different to you, for you to un try to understand and imagine the struggles they're facing. I yes, mean, I love reading love poems or like these like confessions of feelings and like intimacy and blah, blah, blah from authors and then saying, by the way, this female, this woman writer like Hilda Doolittle, HD or whoever, she was writing about a woman. This man was writing about another man. This isn't about a woman. Mm -hmm. And the, and the, you know, and it was so funny. I remember talking about Rambo and Verlaine, these two French symbolists. I, I love their, I love their works, crazy personal lives, but I love their works. And, you know, and I was like, oh, and then, you know, Verlaine and Rambo, they went to Brussels together. Verlaine abandoned his wife and young child and they ran away to Brussels together. And they had these like absinthe and opium fueled arguments and like screamed at each other. And then, uh, Verlaine shot Rambo in the hand, or was it the other way around? I can't remember. But one of them shot the other one. And then, and I said, and they had this crazy time and they were like so in love with each other. And one of the boys goes, wait a second, aren't they both boys? And I was like, yeah. And everybody kind of just laughed. I mean, you kind of like, didn't you realize that? And he was like, oh, oh, okay. And just like, let it, let it fly. And then also in that class, another student of mine actually said, even having gender roles, what's the point of that? He said, what's the point of that? Yeah. What purpose does that serve? Why can't people just be who they are? Yeah. And it was, I was so excited to hear that from a young person. It was yes. so exciting to because hear that. I grew up with friends that came from certain ethnic backgrounds where yes. the father and the family, and this is a it's the patriarch. real life story. I can tell you the, all the details after we stop recording, but basically this person <laughs> said to me, her father would not allow the son to clean up in the kitchen and sweep the floor in case it would make him gay. And oh I'm just God. like, how, what, if, if anything, if your boy is already straight, first of all, he has to be straight to begin with. Second of all, if the boy straight boy has domestic skills, that's hot. Of course it's hot. Even it's hot to me. You've told me stories about, guys and you know when you know seeing them in certain ways you were telling me and I was like wow even to yes. me that's hot like and then he gave me a book to look at and while he cleaned his house with no shirt on <laughs> <laughs> true story true, true story that's the story I'm thinking about Amy when you yeah. told me that I was like oh my god this is hot yep like, and then he also made dinner that night we went to a, a farmer's market like market here and he was going around to all the, the vendors and like picking up bunches of herbs and sniffing things and like knocking on melons. It was super hot. I'm telling you watching I that man buy food. I just understand the like logic. What, what it is, it is a turn on, but what parent would raise their child like that? Like to me, 
you want your child, man or woman, to be able to do, to not raise them with gender roles and be able to change a tire, whether you're a boy or a girl, to be able to cook a meal, whether you're a boy or a girl, go and iron yeah. your clothes, whether you're a boy or a girl. Like yeah. it's, what does, why are people what so does, afraid? It's just, oh, and it's what does disgusting. gender and sexuality have to do with being able to be a functioning adult in the world? Nothing. Like, okay, we're not all going to have sexuality yeah. is such a small part of who we are it's just I know. So and we're, we're not all going to be like me- it. yeah we're not all going to be mechanically adept or like good at like working with tools or like good at cooking in the kitchen or whatever but i am telling you like and i tell this to my students sometimes also they find out i play soccer on a soccer team here and that freaks them out and i'm like as far as i'm aware you don't need a penis to kick a ball <laughs> In fact, you try to avoid contact in that area with the ball at all times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I said, and as far as I'm aware, you know, I like I've never like I haven't died. Nothing terrible happened to me because I play a quote unquote boys sport in very macho boyland Turkey. Yeah, I know. And like and being a functional adult, like being able to figure out how to do laundry, figure out how to cook, figure out how to do simple home repairs. This is not things that should be gendered. These are no, things that should be, everybody great, should know how to do that. Great better. asset, you know, I don't, I don't get yeah. it. Yeah. Anyways. And what we... if you live alone? Then what do you do? Well, you what have about, to be able what to about do me? I, I had to fix up all these shelves and I was laughing with you, Amy, saying, because the joke between you and I is that yes. you're the one who's more inclined to be the toolbox type than I am. Yes. Right? yes. Talking about stereotypes. I am not the stereotype or whatever that stereotype is supposed to be. I, this table that my coffee cup is resting on was actually set up by our two girls that we used to have girls night with who are oh, both yeah. great girls. <laughs> They came over yeah. and I'm like, guys, I bought this table. I don't know how to set it up. And they were like down on the floor setting it up. Hello, yeah. you know who you are and you're listening. I love yes. this table and can't do without it. But I bought these shelving <laughs> units here and I was joking with you, Amy. I'm like, oh God, I have to fix it up myself. I don't know what to do. Amy, I wish you could be here and fix it for me. Yeah, because you're, you're more the toolbox type than I am. Like, yeah, I'm, I do all that kind of stuff all the time. Last year during the pandemic, I replaced a tap in my bathroom. I fixed toilets. I've built Ikea furniture without instructions after moving. I rebuilt it. And without a man to do it for you. Without a man. Yeah, without a man. Yeah. Anyways, Amy, should we wrap this one up? Is there anything else yeah. you want to say about Hoxenhaven or bullying before we close up? I kind of wish there were more in-depth I, I do wish there was a little bit more in depth, maybe a whole episode even about LGBTQ culture in Denmark on Borgen, but there hasn't been, as far as I'm aware, an episode that focuses strictly on that. I think it comes up later in later seasons. There's another character who's out um, in season three, I think, but I don't think we see that in season two. Um, but hopefully like it would be great if, if um, we saw that more, but maybe, maybe it's, Maybe it's generally, maybe this but is it. Like, as, as we said, maybe it's also a, a, a decade thing, right? That this yeah, was true. in the early 2010s. And it is, yeah. it is more a political show that chose not to go down the LGBT path of exploration, which is fine. As an LGBT person, I don't feel betrayed by that. Like I said, I, I felt yeah. great relief in seeing Brigitte's in, emotional intelligence and friendship to Hawks and Avon, right? But there is yeah, season allyship. four, which neither allyship, exactly, LGBT allyship, which I was so proud to see her display when she could have gone the other way and been nasty to him. But there is season four, which has not aired yet in Canada or yeah, in hasn't aired Turkey either. Yeah. And I believe it's going to come out in June worldwide. This episode will air before June, but maybe there is going to be an LGBT uh, character. And Amy, we can do a future bonus episode when we get to talking about season four, about, you know, how the attitude evolved from Hawks and Haven to current day, if there is that storyline. Um, yes. But yeah. 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 We'll see how it goes. And I love doing bonus episodes. And I know we usually go quite, we went kind of quite all over the place. But I think it was important. And like, obviously, we both have stakes in the rainbow community, as it were, because like, I have to support the kids I work with, I have to support my friends. And I've always felt connected to the queer community. Actually, my best friend growing up when I was a little kid turned out, you know, came out in her 20s. And like, so like that energy, like on that understanding has always kind of been running in the background. Yeah. And so like, that's why even even I feel weird saying, yeah, I'm a straight girl. And like, 
Am I though? 100%? I don't think so, 100%. But, you know, most of my relationships have been with men, but, but I that's, don't feel that's like okay. That, that, like, yeah. Yeah. And that, that box of like, that box of like, you're a heterosexual person, you behave like this. I don't like that. And I don't want to be put in that box. Well, actually, a lot of my straight women friends don't like that. I'm thinking of two right now yeah. in my head who are just the antithesis of that silly stereotype, right? There. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. Anyways, with that, Amy, let's wrap this one up. We'd like yeah, to thank our listeners <laughs> for joining us on this long episode of the bonus episode you can check us out on our website theborganpodcast.com where all of our episodes are archived and you can learn more about us and the show we'd like to thank our good friend garth jensen for providing our intro and outro music thank you very much garth and lastly don't forget to check us out on all social media platforms we are there and we'd love to hear from you don't forget to connect with us and subscribe to our podcast uh, so you know when new episodes come out and share what's on your mind by using the hashtag the Borgen podcast or by sending us an email or voice memo at the Borgen podcast at gmail.com.